All right. So, um, Jim Frederick, who, who used to come with me and do this, who's now retired, uh, usually talks about the drying problems and defects. So we'll we'll go through some of these. But um, you know, Jim gets a lot of smart answers when he asks that question. Sometimes, so we'll we'll bypass that. But basically. Um, Whenever we exceed uh, the strength of the brick, we apply more force than the strength can can or the we apply more force to the brick than its its green strength can handle or the dry strength can handle. We start to open up cracks. Now that could be from um, it could be from steam pressure inside the brick. It could be from some kind of applied load when the brick is trying to shrink. Uh, it's not uncommon. Don't you see a lot of uh, breakage on the bottom row of the car? Okay, because you've got um, basically a car that's not moving. You know, it's dimensionally stable, more or less. Uh, and then you've got brick on it trying to shrink, and then there's brick, there's weight on top of that. Uh, so that can cause this, this type of um, breaking that you see. Typically, we see it around the, the weakest point on the brick. So if you've got a thin face shell, um, you've got a big core hole, it's more susceptible there uh, than, than places where you've got thicker or more meat on the brick. Um, so it can be applied loads or it could be a thermal gradient, okay, a temperature differential that's causing differential drying rate, okay, so one part's drying faster than the other and you've got differential shrinkage across the brick. <coughs> so um, physical stress like we talked about, the weight of one brick on top of the other, um, that's especially important on the bottom course uh, where the deck block's not moving uh, but the brick on top of it's trying to. So sometimes you use plastic. Do you use plastic here? I got involved with that recently. Paper, okay, yeah. paper. paper. Some people use paper. You could use sand. Um, anything there that, that helps the brick move a little bit. Um, you see all those things. Uh, but we, I've been working on one where they use plastic and um, their stack test came back higher in chlorine than they expected. And we looked at the chlorine content of the plastic and it was pretty high. Um, so. Uh, it was a, an emission source we hadn't counted on. Um, so thermal gr gradient, uneven evaporation rate, uneven moisture content. So basically you got the brick trying to, to go through uh, a change, um, not all at the same time. Because remember, usually drying involves a shrinkage. This same kind of thermal gradient uh, can cause you failures uh, in the cooling zone, where part of the brick's gone through the quartz inversion we talked about, part of it hasn't yet. Um, depending on how the air is impacting it. Um, so thermal gradients can cause problems in, in different ways. <coughs> so a lot of times, um, Dr. Robinson used to say, we create defects in extrusion, but we open them up in either the dry or the kill. So their they're lamination planes, their weaknesses uh, in the material that when shrinkage starts to happen, we open up and then we see. So we, we can't see them until later on. Um, so dryers can't correct faults that are already there. Uh, but they can, they can lessen the effects. Uh, but you can't make, if you've got a lamination from extrusion, uh, you can't make it go away with a good dryer cycle. Okay, um, It's there. Uh, so by creating faster, more efficient drying cycles, um, uh, typically, uh, you can, in some cases, you can uh, get better product quality uh, because you have less of that thermal gradient and things like that. So when will a brick crack? Or it'll be less likely to crack uh, when you increase the strength. Okay, um, how do you increase the strength? There are several ways uh, that I can think of. Grinding finer always helps with strength. Um, it may increase shrinkage some. Um, uh, but you can get some pretty substantial improvements in plasticity and green strength by going from an 8 mesh to a 20 mesh. The um, reason I know that is from dealing with uh, quarry tile when I was in the tile industry. Um, but it makes a huge difference. Uh, you can add, use additives. Do any of you use additive A? Yeah. Yeah. Additive A is a great glue. Okay, It's a little bit of a deflocculant too. Um, but you can get some really substantial green strength and, and dry strength improvements uh, with additive A. Um, it's why people use it. it it's, uh, you're just basically gluing uh, the brick together till you get it to, into the firing zone and you form glass. <coughs> uh, you can play with particle size distribution. 
bigger particles tend to have a lot of stress around them. So if you can reduce the fraction of the really coarse stuff, uh, a lot of times you can create, you can improve strength. Um, when you can decrease stress. Now you decrease stress uh, by not having lamination defects and that's that's uh, everybody's goal but it's it's almost impossible to get there I think. There's always going to be some sort of um, uh, extrusion defect to some degree but minimizing that as much as possible. Um, having an appropriate particle size. Okay not really extreme uh, coarse uh, particles the, if you get really, really coarse particles, you tend to see more of this. Um, drying in a controlled way uh, that minimizes the stress. Controlling the shrinkage uh, so that it doesn't happen too quickly like we saw in that chart where we had the big dip in, in dry strength uh, as we speed it up. So tests to predict um, uh, optimum drying rate. Uh, the British have a, a test where they do uh, basically a wafer and they I guess they're looking for cracking there. Um, Harrop uses a single brick. We use a single brick and we do that Bijo test um, to look for drying conditions uh, where we're looking to see what percent of the drying cycle uh, is it at the critical moisture content. Uh, we have the lingual where we can look at uh, brick loads, single brick or we can look at loads. Uh, and then this is that, that Bijo um, where we have a constant uh, condition where we look at the percent moisture content versus shrinkage. So there are different ways of evaluating drying behavior and uh, trying to predict optimum conditions. So this is uh, that British drying test. Uh, I should have asked Jim more about this since he made it. <coughs> I'll have to find out. I'm not sure um, how quickly that's working. So we'll find out. I've never seen that one run. Harrop has a drying test. This is very similar to what we're doing in our, our dryer. They're measuring shrinkage, uh, weight loss. So this, this brick's basically hanging from a balance. Um, they've got a heating source. They've got a fan. Uh, we've got a steam generator so we can raise and lower the humidity. Uh, it gets kind of hard to control these things because you've got so many input variables. Um, you got to think about what you want first. So you get the temperature and then you bring the humidity up. It's one of the ways we do it. Um, but you can measure shrinkage and you can measure weight loss. That's basically what we do in our dryer. And you can get curves like this. Uh, so if you have a specific drying temperature you want, or a, a dryer profile you want to look at. Um, so this one is, this is a temperature. Um, so you can see they've got a moderate temperature. These, this is a relative humidity. So the humidity is dropping steadily until they get to the point. I'm assuming this is end of stage one where shrinkage is stopped. And they get a big jump in temperature. Uh, and then they, they go to their final temperature. So this, this jump in temperature also coincides with a drop in humidity. Um, so that is probably, yep, shrinkage is changing direction right there. It's, it's close to coming to a stop. So we can do that too in our, our type of dryer. We can develop curves like that. But mostly we're putting in standard conditions uh, and getting out a response. So <laughs> what they're doing um, in this case, uh, they're, they're running through drying tests and looking to see it's a pass fail. Did the brick crack? Did it not crack? Um, in our case, we, we found that this wasn't that sensitive, that we actually had to get in and measure strength of the brick uh, to, to get a better indication that, that the brick was okay. After the, after the fact or? Yeah, well, we would take them out and measure the dry strength. And if we dried them too fast, you, you could tell in the dry strength. A long time before we would see cracks develop is we were drying them faster and faster in that example I gave before. So the, the strength is more um, is more sensitive to, to drying defects than appearance. Your eye can't detect it as quick as the the strength testing machine can. Or the strength drops off. Um, so they, they have different types of tests uh, that they do, different cycles and Usually the way, I know the way that um, Sarik did it uh, when they were still Sarik before they were Direxa 
is basically they had a catalog of dryer curves, of those Bijou dryer curves. And they could go and they would try to match your material to one of those existing ones. And they'd say, okay, for this material, this worked. And based on experience, and they designed the, the dryer this way. Uh, it looks like what they're doing here is um, they're running through a series of tests and deciding uh, where cracking occurred. And then they're backing off to stay below what caused the cracking. So they're pushing the brick harder and harder, uh, seeing what they can get away with. Uh, and when they exceed that, then they come back and design your cycle based on what they learned. Would, would geography um, matter? If the geometry of the brick? No, geography, like where, where it looked like the parts of that. It would. So that is going to be a worst case. You know, you're, when you've got a single brick like that, it's exposed to the most airflow. Um, if you had the brick deep inside the car, yeah, it's never going to see those kind of conditions. So you would assume it was having a much more gentle drying rate. So you're testing the worst case with these. For the brick on the outside, probably the outside top of the car that are seeing the most air. Because when you get cracking on the car, you either get it on the bottom or the top, right? Or the outside, usually. Um, this is another uh, derivative of that Bijo. It's plotted a little bit differently. Um, so they basically have experience on that and they design their dryer schedule based on, on what that curve looks like. Okay, so they use a rule of thumb. Shrinkage is complete uh, when half the body water is gone. So this is, is some of the stuff Dr. Robinson did, and we've done si similar type work. MOR, anybody know what that is? It's modulus of rupture. Basically, it's a three-point band. So you, you have your bar, and you apply a load right in the middle. It's supported on either end, and you measure the, the breaking strength. Um, anybody ever use like a Hogue tester to do green strength on the line? Do y'all still use those? Okay. Yeah, and, you and basically you you had a bar, you had some sort of supports, your bar sat across them, and basically you had another pin, and you pushed on that one. Yeah, yeah, and you would try to make a crack right through there. Yeah, yeah. Have a gauge or yep, and tell you how much force, and you can measure displacement. Um, so, uh, Dr. Robinson was looking at the uh, modulus of rupture as the brick dried. Um, so, it, as extruded, obviously it's softest. And as the moisture content decreases, uh, this would be your, your green strength, and then this would be your dry strength. Um, you transition between the two. So brick, it, brick are weakest uh, when they're the most wet. They're the easiest to deform at that point. That's why we're adding the water to, to be at that, that point. And um, so what, uh, I don't know if you noticed on those curves that I had earlier where they were coming from our experimental dryer, you'd see a dip and then when we'd start uh, drying and then they would start to, to shrink, they would actually grow a little bit. So what Dr. Robinson found is if you take the, the green brick and you wrap it up and you let it sit around, it actually loses strength for a period of time. We see it as an expansion um, in that drying test uh, where I've always kind of contributed that to uh, the moisture content uh, distributing and equalizing through the brick so that it's, it's kind of um, conditioning itself, uh, if you will. One of the interesting things we found, if you want to increase drying rate, is if you have a way, and this is sort of what you're doing in your holding room, if you have a way to heat up the brick, okay, so say uh, you extruded it, but it didn't go in the dryer right away and it got cold. If you can heat up the brick before it goes in the dryer, so you, you have some way of wrapping it, keeping it wet, um, but you can get the temperature up, the, the surface tension, or the, um, Viscosity of water drops pretty dramatically with temperature, uh, and you can get higher, much higher drying rates without causing damage with warm water than you can with cold water. 
So just by changing the temperature of the water, you can push it uh, out of the brick faster without causing defects. So um, this is uh, an example dryer looking at moving air around. <laughs> looking at recirculation to keep the humidity high. So once that air becomes saturated, all of the evaporation is going to stop. So here it looks like they're trying to heat up the brick and keep the, the humidity high. You see by uh, the time it gets further down, it's 100% um, relative humidity. So uh, in this example, um, Drying air becomes very dry and removes moisture from the brick uh, aggressively. And I apologize, I'm not, uh, I didn't review these as much as I should have with Jim before we came. This is usually his. The ratio of recirculation to draft determines how aggressively moisture is pulled from brick surfaces. So that's recirculation, which is trying to bring the humidity up, and then draft is, is pulling your hot supply through. Okay. Yeah, so it's hotter at that end, and by the time it's down here, it's cooler, but the humidity's dropped off. So that's what I need to learn more about. So drying defects. Um, it hotter or colder? No, it's hotter at this end. And colder as you're going toward the exit. Yeah. Yeah. So types of defects, um, again this is from Dr. Robinson and Corrective Practices. There are papers like this on our website. Um, if you go in and you look up drying, uh, there's stuff on this. So load cracks, what they look like. Um, a lot of times coming off a core you'll see a crack like this. It's not uncommon to see it on the bottom of the brick meaning something was pushing on it in this way and, and stressing it more than it could handle. So for load cracks you need to bring the strength up. Um, different ways to do that. Get a tighter body, um, uh, increase, uh, get rid of the biggest particles in it, try to get it just a little bit finer, that will help. And what a lot of people do is add additive A. Um, put more glue in it, give it more strength. Additive A is much more effective in the dry state than it is in the green, um, but it really, as the brick dries, it really magnifies the, the strength there. Crazing cracks, uh, laminations, so face cracks like that, um, it means that the water vapor was having trouble getting through that surface skin, uh, and you get that kind of uh, cracked, uh, you know, cracked clay on, on the ground look. So they call that crazing. Crazing means something else in tile. It uh, has to do with uh, whether you're, you've got a thermal expansion mismatch with the glaze. Uh, but here it's, it's characteristic of that. That's a permeability issue. So uh, we need to open the body to, to minimize that. Usually to open the body you're trying to put in more coarse is, is what people do. Restraint cracks are due to low strength, uh, high shrinkage and excessive load. If this is your problem, yeah, typically what people do is they try to add more grog. Or, um, that doesn't look like a dye skin, but you try to get the dye skin off uh, of the bricks. So, because the dye skin, all that is, is you got clay particles that are oriented, and it tends to be very impermeable. So, if you can shave that off, you can make it easier to dry. Okay, so that's why it's smooth. We maybe have more issues with this than with the... Yeah, you'd always see this worse on smooth brick. You see a lot of that too. Mm-hmm. Face cracks. The little face cracks that don't go all the way through. Yep. And the brick is still fine, but they 
Yeah. It's cosmetic, but the ASTM standards say you judge from 25 feet or something like that. 20. 20 feet under certain illumination, and if hopefully you can't see them from those, you probably could see. And but and our salesmen, they don't know those specifications. Oh no. Care about <laughs> well, I I will tell you, going to those ASTM groups, they're written by brick people, so they're sort of written for our benefit. Yeah. I know. yeah. I shouldn't have said that, especially if you're taping me. Yeah. Okay. You were pulling too high a vacuum or not enough vacuum? They were pulling not enough. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see that. You have way more, more force on one side of the Or differential flow. So you've got a slip plane in between the two. So restraint cracks um, are similar to load cracks, but just uh, ten bigger magnitude. Um, this is one. So this would have probably been the bottom side of the the uh, brick where it was sitting on the car deck, uh, and it was trying to shrink, and there wasn't any give. So, so it opened up a crack. Could that be decreased by increasing the like used paper, so it could be putting more paper down? There? So even with paper, you're getting cracks down there. Uh, it's not bad, but yeah. Could it be decreased by adding more paper? Um, paper, sand. I don't know if a second piece of paper would help, but I. I just didn't know if that would give it more of a, I guess, flow. Yeah. It might. The only way you're going to know is to try it, probably. Yeah. Most people use sand. You know, a lot of people use sand. Yeah, fine sand, like a um, play sand or something like that that's going to. You don't want a, a lot of big particles in the sand. You want it to be like ball bearings. It's kind of dangerous because, like, over time you're putting that, it's going to fall through the cracks and you're killing cars, and then all of a sudden you're yeah. running your problem with your, with your car block and spreading and yeah. rubbing in the, in the rails. And, and, you know, it's kind of. That's there. why you use a car cleaner, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what they're talking about. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Right. Well, if you you're weighing the brick, it'll tell you how much moisture's left in it. And that's what you really care about before it goes back in the dryer or in the kill. Yeah. Because when the first part or the first burner group hits it, if there's moisture left. Right. Yeah. Well, you're probably weighing the brick out of the dryer right. before it goes in the kiln because we're required to by your permit because we gotta know how much how much moisture we we gotta we gotta weigh the brick going into the kiln and after the kill. Mm -hmm. That's for your to calculate your control people at most plants are taking a brick there to see how much moisture is still in the brick. But yeah. maybe you don't do that. Most <coughs> plants do that as a routine every day. Well, what they, I'm saying they is they check if you move the information right then, if they didn't, could you increase like the heat in the preheat or whatever to, to try to remove ex extra moisture? Or well, well, by the time it's out, right. you, all you're doing is getting the... the yeah. 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 So that's the nice thing when I worked in the tile industry. When you were doing a, a plant trial or something on a new body, 45 minutes you had an answer. <laughs> you know, instead of waiting uh, whatever drying cycle. Yeah. Well, you know, like a you took a brick off before you put it in the kill and you went in there and waited and you had something, a scale or something to look at judge that mm -hmm. what you buy well, to determine whether it's more moisture or not to let you know how much moisture content is mm -hmm. so what do you rule of thumb what one percent moisture is okay most a lot of people are half percent okay yeah I can tell you even even burners at some plant are required to take a brick 
before it goes in the kiln. And yeah, I mean, there, there are quick ways to do a moisture check, okay? Mm -hmm. There are quick methods that will give you an answer in 10 minutes or so. You know, you don't have to put it in the oven and wait overnight or something. So there are methods for checking moisture coming out of your dryer to make sure you're not putting wet brick in the kiln. Yeah. So do you use microwaves in the plant or? Well, you, you can. Or do you just use moisture balances? Or? Yeah, moisture yeah. balance. Now the moisture balance, does it matter where you take the pea, the sample? I'd want to take it from the, the center of the brick center if I could. Brick. Yeah, yes, okay. It, I wasn't going into all the details, but they, they, they will break the brick, brick apart and scrape out the very center where it's going to be wet, possibly. And they just get a few grams yeah. and they do that in a quick dryer. It's a little balance machine with a heating element. Yeah. It and, it, it and it senses when it, it the weight loss stops and it, it says, okay, that's your moisture content. It's dry. Mm -hmm. So that's just like a 10 minute test, then? Yeah, depending on how much material you put in. And how much moisture is in it. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, you're very good. Yeah, 10 minutes. Okay, did we do a three hour oven test? Mm -hmm. You can do that too. It takes three hours, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, moisture balance is quicker, but they cost something. They're not free. So. All right. So, another example of restraint cracks in a brick. Uh, where uh, the brick was trying to shrink. So I guess another solution for that would be reducing shrinkage, right? Adding some grog so you, it's not moving as much. So some products, um, you know, other other types of ceramics you, you see, uh, we were talking earlier, um, you know, in a whiteware tile you might see 10% drying shrinkage uh, and trying to keep that flat while it's drying that much and shrinking that much is not easy. Um, so, you know, shrinkage is usually a bad thing. You try to minimize that as much as possible. <laughs> so low strengths, uh, high shrinkage. So you can, for the restraint cracks, you try to increase the strength. Uh, you try to reduce shrinkage. And then whatever you can do to reduce the load on the brick. So it might be a little higher coring or something like that, a different setting pattern. Um, anything to get some of the material out of the dryer. Uh, shelling, um, uh, there, uh, that's where, I don't know if I've got a picture from it. Nope. Shelling is, you were talking about the face comes off the brick. Um, what's interesting to me is that type of failure you see uh, from wet brick, uh, sometimes going in the raw material, looks a lot like a freeze thaw failure. They, they give you the sort of, sort of the same appearance, but um, Shelling could be raw materials, a very tight body, or it could be gradients from the drying process where you've either got shrinkage gradients, some kind of stress in the brick that, that's causing that to pop off. You have a picture of the shelling? We don't. No? So like if I was a, like, you'll go through development or whatever, and you yeah. see like the face come off, would that be mm -hmm. considered shelling? Yeah. Yeah, if you're looking at the top of the car, you can see that just the raw material that you're exposed and some of those you got the, the color on so we could have a little chunk over the top. So differential shrinkage like we talked about, it's bad in firing, it's bad in drying. Um, what we, we theoretically want to happen is everything to kind of stay together <laughs> so that shrinkage is happening uniformly. We know it doesn't. Um, so when you have a high shrinkage uh, the chance of having developing stress from the outside of the car drying faster than the inside of the car uh, where part of it is shrunk and part of it hasn't shrunk yet increases. Uh, so uh, that causes stress and that can cause either things to, to come out of, of square um, uh, or it can cause cracks to develop on the inside. So uh, anytime we can minimize uh, differential shrinkage usually by controlling uh, temperature profile, uh, we try to do that. So, just some examples. Uh, this is similar to the example I was telling you about how drying rate influence, influences shrinkage. So when you're drying, you have the forming water separating the particles. And um, as we're uh, going along and we're trying to, to remove that water, these particles are approaching each other until they bump into each other and that's when shrinkage stops. So there could still be like we would call this pore water now because uh, it's sort of a trap space that has water. Um, 
but it is uh, basically the the structure we create controls shrinkage. So when we add more coarse, you get that bump earlier, and and the particles stop moving relative to each other. Um, so when we have fast uh, drying, we're removing the water very quickly. You can end up with the particles in orientations where they're they're not in their best stress state, um, or where they're they're not happy with the way they're lined up. And slower drying as we we move that water, you get the particles to line up uh, uh, in a way that they're a little more happy. So uh, when we end up uh, with a fast drying rate, um, and you uh, end up with only 50% drying on this spot where the body's still expanded and there's still space between the particles versus on this end where all the shrinkage is taking place and the particles are touching, uh, there's a, a, a growth difference in the brick. And if that growth difference is big enough, uh, we can end up with uh, a crack opening up to relieve that stress. So part of it is shrunk, like this, this skin they're showing on the surface has shrunk, uh, but the rest of the brick hasn't. Um, sometimes you have to relieve that stress and it relieves itself by creating cracks. So pre-strain pre -strain cracks like what we were showing uh, are from uh, excessive shrinkage or differential design. Um, it could be uh, from cracks that, or defects that were there from the forming process. Um, so these are, are things that, that are potentially uh, that are potentially there from other parts or from before we got the brick. So this is a pre-strain crack where I think this was a, a flow problem around the bridge, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that we just opened up that, that damage that was already there in the dryer. Another example. Um, where the material didn't knit back together fully and uh, we just opened that up in the dryer. So warping, um, we do a warpage measurement on brick. Uh, usually that's from uh, either some sort of uh, residual stress in the raw material or it's from differential drying um, causing the brick to, to twist slumping, soft spots, um, some scumming usually is an indication that you exceeded the dew point temperature at some point in the dryer. Um, when you exceed the dew point temperature it means the air can't support the moisture it's got and it rains. Okay, and wherever it rains on the brick uh, you can end up with some soft spots or some weird looking stuff. So in this case water got on the brick it made it look like little smears. Oh, so where it got wet, basically the, remember we said when it's wet, it's got its lowest screen strength, so it got excessively wet and we got some deformation uh, where it basically squashed. Um, from the, the weight of the brick on top because of that condensation. So yeah, that's a uh, crazy looking brick. Looks like that one's tumbled. Uh, this is a common, when we were talking about scumming, that white is from calcium sulfate. Um, so this was uh, probably sitting on a rack of some sort and drying was taking place here and the salts kind of accumulated uh, where it was sitting on the rack. <coughs> Another example of scumming, uh, so this uh, the air was probably hitting this end where drying uh, was taking place. So the water's migrating this way, carrying the salt with it to the surface. And when the water evaporates, it leaves the salt behind. Once you fire it, that uh, calcium is incorporating with the glass at the surface of the brick and it's, it's permanent at that point. So 
So that is a rock that got uh, inside the brick and the rock has a different thermal expansion than the brick. So you had um, uh, clay material trying to shrink around a rock that wasn't going anywhere and it caused that crack. So foreign material. This is an example of bad mixing. So you had a kaolin and a fire clay and they didn't get anywhere near to mixed and because of that they have different shrinkages and they just don't knit together very well. Uh, so the probably the white shrinks more and it's going to pull away from the yellow. So that could be fixed with good mixing. So if um, guides to, to dry faster without defects, um, extensive use of non-plastics. Okay, so basically coarser distribution uh, if you can. That opens up the body, makes it easier for the water to get out. It also reduces shrinkage. Okay, when you can reduce shrinkage, uh, typically uh, you have a lot less problems with dryer defects. So additives that minimize shrinkage um, and increase strength. So uh, things like additive A that increase strength that gives you more ability to resist dimensional change. Um, less tendency to crack. Uh, extrude at your lowest moisture content. That means you're going to have a little bit higher green strength and you've got less work to do. Less shrinkage, um, less water to remove. But you can't go so far that, that you can't extrude the material. Um, column temperature. Okay, so if the column temperature is very high, we've all seen it where the column steams, it's drying. Okay, and it's shrinking in an uncontrolled way before it ever gets to the holding room. So if you have a sensitive material, um, this is a bad thing because you're, you're basically getting a fair amount of drying that you've got uh, no hope for controlling. Uh, maximize core volume. Okay, bigger cores uh, mean uh, less thickness uh, for the water to have to travel. So you're, you're reducing um, the, basically the area that the water's got to get out of and you're allowing more air in uh, to the brick, you're opening up the setting. Uh, there's less weight on the car, so there's less water that has to be evaporated. Um, so generally those, those type of things help you out. <coughs> and maximize air contact. That has to do with uh, not only the coring but the setting pattern. Uh, make sure that the brick are exposed to air if possible. Now that goes against what you're generally told where you got to get more brick through the kill all the time. Okay, to do that you got to pack them closer together, right? Or push them harder. Um, but what this is saying for to reduce drying defects is you need to spread them out. And so a lot of the, the newer type dryers are actually uh, rack type dryers. Where you're drying on a rack and you can keep the brick spread out and you can make sure you get good air space. It's not a direct car set. Which people don't like to do because it's an extra step in manufacturing. An extra place for equipment and stuff to go wrong and prevent temperature cycling during drying. Uh, no ups and downs. Same thing applies in cooling. Um, an even temperature rise and, and good control over humidity. So preconditioning, um, that's what I was talking about by heating up water. Uh, if possible, if you can heat up the water a little bit uh, before you try to dry it so you heat up the brick at 100% humidity, if possible, sort of like what you're trying to do in the holding room, um, that can make it much easier to get out the water. Uh, and it mainly has to do with changing the viscosity of water. It makes it easier to, to come out. There actually, um, there was uh, a drying technology that came out of England called an airless dryer in the early 2000s. And basically it was a chamber where you heated up the brick to, to um, a closed chamber where you heated up the brick to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And once that was there, you started bleeding off a little bit of the pressure and you let it dry basically without applying air. It was like a, basically a steam kettle. And they claimed because of the high temperature, you got natural uniformity in the drying rate. So um, they were taking advantage of this type of thing. How well did it work? Uh, I've never seen one commercially available. <laughs> so have you ever heard of the airless dryer? <coughs> 
Uh, it was uh, something in the UK, but basically it was a chamber where you heated up the brick and then you, um, you opened up a valve once it was above 212 and you controlled the rate that the steam came out. So it was like a tea kettle for brick. But they, they claimed it gave you better uh, control and less defects. So this is what the viscosity of water does as a function of temperature. Um, this doesn't seem like a lot, but you almost cut it in half uh, going from 70 degrees to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the idea of a preconditioning in a holding room if you have some ability to to bring up the temperature while keeping the humidity high enough that you're not drying. Okay, so warm brick, dry easier than cold brick. Any questions on drying? Okay. You guys look like you're on the edge of your seats, ready to learn all about ASTM. No? Okay. Um, yeah, what was that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I actually changed the slides around a little bit than what's actually in your book that I just got to review it before we came out here and unfortunately all those, well, it's not that much different. I just crunched stuff down a little bit and tried to clarify a little bit. There's also uh, something that hasn't been changed in a while to where um, how, I assume the majority of you are familiar with ASTM, the standards. Uh, C67 and 216 are the ones that you guys are going to hear about the most going through this. C67 are the methods that are used to test the product and then 216 and then if you're doing pavers, 216 is for regular facing brick that are 25% void area and less and then uh, C652 is for Void areas. The if your uh, cores are larger, if it's above 25 percent, which you'll see going through this, then it falls under 652. When you look at the two standards, 216, 652, it's basically the same specifications. It's just under 652. You also have to specify how much void area the the brick is made of or contains. Um, Another way to think about it: How many of you make modular brick? You're you're using 216. Mm -hmm. on the modular brick. And how many are making king size? A lot of you probably just make king size. Probably, or you don't make any modular, you make king size. That'd be under 652 probably. Uh, and again, it depends on how, how, yeah, how much void area you right. have in it. The, what you're seeing from John on drying, you're trying to get the water out of the product, so the thinner you can make things, the easier it is to get the water out typically because you're not trying to pull it as deep out of the product. So that's saying you want to have more core volume in it to where you want to, the, the bigger you make your cores, the thinner the walls get and the easier it is to, to dry and fire. But at the same time, you're also trying to make these to where they're durable and the more material you take out of the product, typically the less weight it will, it'll be able to support. So it's, Again, there's a lot of balancing that you're doing when you're making your product, which you'll see see through this. One of the things right off the get-go, um, we're actually under dash 16 now. ASTMs get reviewed on a regular basis, almost quite a few of them almost on a yearly basis. Even if it means that you're not even changing anything, you still want to continue to, to review it. And the ASTM committees, which John is a part of, I'm a part of, are basically made up of uh, three different sections to where you have the manufacturer, you have the consumer, and then you have third parties, which we're considered a third party because we're the lab that goes in and tests. And the whole idea is you're trying to get a decent represent, rep representation of the people that are going to be using the standard. And that way if, for instance, it was only the brick manufacturers that were involved in writing the standards, the specifications would probably be far easier to meet. If the consumer is the one that was writing the standards, the specifications would probably be near impossible to meet. And then the third parties are more, we're the ones who have to perform this test, so we want to review it to say, okay, from a lab standpoint, is this realistic? One of the things that we're reviewing right now is 
There's C67 and uh, 140, uh, 170. There's several standards that call for drying. And right now, the concrete ones are different than the brick ones, the fired ceramic ones. Which means for us to do it, we have to keep changing temperatures in our dryers whenever we go through and dry this. So we're trying to unify as much as we can to get everything as consistent as we can if it's not going to affect the final quality of the test or, or the, uh, the, what the de test determines. So, scope. Uh, C67 is basically covers the procedures that we use on fired ceramics. Um, this includes brake load, compression strength, absorption, or uh, freeze thaw, IRA, efflorescence. Uh, brake load, there's also MOR, modules of rupture, which we'll go over as well. And then the size, the dimensional requirements of the product. Um, go through absorption first. Uh, you start off doing a cold water absorption, excuse me, in which you select five fired brick and then you dry them. And again, this is where we're talking to 230 degrees F for 24 hours and then you take consecutive measurements every two hours to make sure that the weight isn't changing after that time. If the weight after 24 hours and then two hours later is the same, you know that you've removed all the water out of it. If it keeps changing, you leave it in the dryer until that number stops changing. Most, I can't say we've run into one yet at the lab since I've been there that we've run into an issue where it was still drying after 24 hours. And then you go through and you weigh the brick. Um, okay, that was different. Oh, it's got a this is going to be, I didn't realize this had the little automation in it, so this is going to be really confusing. Um, so after you go through and you weigh the brick, you completely submerge them in water for the specified time, whether you're doing a 5-hour or a 24-hour soak. This is something I'll have to change. Uh, then you remove the brick and wipe off the surface with a damp cloth, and then you weigh the the brick within five minutes of removing it out of the water. So typically you're taking them out of the bath, dabbing it off with a damp cloth and just taking the weight. Then you go through and from that dry weight and the, um, the saturated weight, you go through and you calculate out what the cold water absorption is. And that's basically the saturated weight minus the dry weight divided by the dry weight times 100. And that'll give you the percent cold water absorption on the product. Is that out of the dryer? Well, you take the, first you take the dry weight after you have them in the dryer for 24 hours and then you take it and do the yeah. saturated weight. And the saturated weight, you're, you're taking the saturated weight, the weight after you leave it in the tank for 24 hours, <coughs> minus the dry weight divided by the dry yeah. weight. No, that's out of the kiln. That's the fired oh, okay. product. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. No, if you use the dry <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you'd have a muddy mess. <laughs> this all this all has to do with uh, fired product, and we do get questions, our requests. Um, I've got a group going through right now of brick that they've pulled out of an old building that's being recycled. C216, that specification is for new product. It's not for uh, aged brick that have already been in service. And one of the reasons is, is that you put it out there, it starts soaking water, giving off water. Every time it soaks in water, you got to think about it, the water is not clean. So it starts pulling in dirt. And you're going to change how your pores react to water. You're going to change how the product reacts to water. So all of, all of these are intended for testing newly produced brick. Um, all right. So but as we go through absorptions, I didn't realize that they had automated these. So this is going to do the same thing. So I thought I was making it quicker for us, but not quite. Uh, boiled water absorption. Um, as you're going through and doing this, you also, for getting the absorptions on the brick, you take the brick after you've done the 24-hour cold water absorption, you then put it in a tank, 
and I heat that up to a boil within an hour. You don't just go on a set, slow, gentle ramp up to where you go ahead and bring it up to a boil within an hour and then you leave it in the boil for the, per the period of time of what that specification uh, C216 calls for a five hour boil. So you would leave it in there for five hours and after five hours you turn the, the flame off and you let it fall naturally. Um, you don't just take them, dump them out into cold water. Uh, you can do a flow of, a slow stream of cold water in and have your hot water flow out, which is what we do at the lab to help aid it in the cooling because our tank is so large. Uh, but you also have to do that at a controlled rate to where you don't just flood it with cold water because you will change the rating or the measurements on the brick by doing that. And so after that, you uh, draw the brick out and the same thing as the cold water, dab it off, take the weight. Uh, calculations for boiled water is roughly the same thing that you just did for the cold water to where you're taking the boiled water weight minus the dry weight divided by the dry weight times 100 and that'll give you the bo boiled water absorptions. And then you basically that didn't, you report the average of all specimens tested for that lot of brick. The uh, saturation, any Can questions? Can you redry the brick between the cold water and the... No. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to, but uh, according to specification, it, you're basically taking it and going straight into boiled water. Okay. Um, you can, there are some requirements out there that you don't do cold water on, you just do boiled water. So then you would just put it in the tank and the procedures are a little bit different. Okay. For C over B ratio, um, this is the saturation coefficient. It is what it says it is. It's cold divided by boiled. So that's the easy way to remember it, C over B ratio. And you're, this, if you want to work it out from the beginning, you can take the 24 the saturated weight from the 24 cold water divided or minus the dry over the boiled minus the dry, but that's the same thing as if you just took the two percentages and did the math that way. Compressive strength. Uh, this is where, if, uh, how many of you guys have sent us product in the past? Pretty much all of you, whether you know it or not. Um, when you do, that's th this is the reason why we ask that you send us 15, at least 15 samples, because if you're doing 216, you'll see all of the testing that goes on, and there are specific requirements that we have to meet at the lab to test the product correctly, even though we found efficient ways of managing that 15 brick going through, 15 is still the minimum. Five of the brick we take and cut in half. Half of them go into compression, compression testing. The other half goes for the absorption. Now, does it matter what brick you pull out from the stack? Let's say you're firing and the bottom one obviously has a little more compressive stress mm. in the brick itself. Will that matter as to what you require for the testing? You are, you are supposed to supply the lab or sample a representative sample, as in this is the range of our product. Um, some of that gets to be a little bit random. Uh, you're, some people will be pulling from cubes, some people will be pulling from cars, but we don't have control of the samples before they come to us, but you're, you as the manufacturer are going through and taking a sample of brick and saying this is representative of what we're producing. So it's, it's up to you to understand your product and say this is the full range of the product that you will be getting when you purchase this product. But they're all supposed to be good. They're all supposed I mean, to be good. When you buy a bag of chips, you don't want the ones at the bottom any better than the ones on the top. In theory, that's true. However, I'm pretty sure you have uh, crumbs, some variation. The crumbs are always the best. <laughs> the crumbs are always the best. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you will have, absolutely, you will have variation throughout the product. And the whole idea is you are doing this to say, okay, we're operating within a range and we feel comfortable when the customer goes and use it, they're going to get what they, we said they're going to get. 
So uh, for compressive strength, you select five half brick. Uh, these are going to be all over the place too. Um, then cap them, and you're either going to cap them in gypsum or sulfur. We do sulfur capping at the lab, so that's what you'll see here, just because it's typically it's quicker for us to where we can go through and test it. So we have a, a nice uh, crock pot full of molten sulfur, and we have a half inch steel plate with these steel L's and you'll pour the sulfur in and you set the brick into it and it cools relatively quickly to where um, our operators will go through and set up three, typically two or three plates, pour some in, set a brick in, pour some in, set a brick in, and then just knock the braces off, take those out, and then pour and do the other side the same way. So you'll end up with a capped specimen that looks like that. And the reason for doing this is if the brick are there's any kind of deviation in the surface and you go through to do a compression test, you are going to create a high stress point load right where that plate comes down and touches it. By doing this, there are, there are requirements too when we cast them that they have to be w within parallel within a certain degree and our compression machines also have a floating head at the top as well. So if those uh, planes aren't perfectly parallel, the head will adjust when it comes in contact with it. So you're putting the stress into the product correctly. And then you'll, this is the spherical head that I was talking about. This is actually round up inside the, the unit and it'll adjust if the, the uh, surfaces are not uh, perfectly parallel. And then you'll, when going through and testing these, you are also, uh, ASTM dictates the rate at which you will load them as well to where you want to apply one half of what the guesstimated load it will take to make the thing go boom at whatever rate you want to. You can just haul booty to get up there and get the, the pressure on it. And then after that, it has to take between one and two minutes for it to actually fail once you slow down. <coughs> so you again, you have to know your product and know kind of what range you're going to be uh, uh, having it fail at. There are also, um, within the requirements, it even says that you probably want to do six brick when you're capping it, just because the first one you're guessing at how fast or where it's actually going to fail at. Uh, our guys have been doing it long enough and we know everybody's product well enough to where we can kind of guess what range it's going to come in. And also, it, if it fails, Typically, if it's more than 45 seconds to failure and it doesn't go much over two minutes, then we still accept it as long as the other four are within. If not, then we have to cap more product and, and retest. And that's typically what you'll end up seeing to where this has cracks coming down. And depending on what it is, that our, our machines will go up to 400,000 pound loads and typically we will have groups that come through that are in the 200, 250,000 pound capacity when they actually fail and you know when they fail. Everybody in the lab knows when they fail. And this is just a readout off of our, uh, the old readout off of our SATEC. We've since updated that. Um, but basically you can watch the, the stress on the, the unit go up until the point, point that it gives. Uh, for reporting, you'll take the compressive strength that you have, the weight that you apply, the load that you're applying to it, and that's divided by the area, the cross-sectional area, because you're reporting the compressive strength as pounds per square inch. And it's basically just how much of a load it will hold before it, it goes away. Any questions so far? Nope. Breaking load and MOR, they're, they're similar. Uh, MOR is, modulus of rupture is a little more complicated on the, the calculation for it. We're just showing break load here. 
the main difference, well, start going through. Um, you're still pulling five full samples and you can see here to where you're putting it on a three-point load. So you have two bars that it spans and then you have a center bar that pushes on it to the point where it'll actually snap the, the product in half. This is typically a paver test. Um, you support it to about one inch the, the length of the, the unit that you're testing. And then the for specimens with recess, and this is the reason why I say at brake load and MOR, the way the specifications are written, brake load, if it has any kind of recesses, frogs, anything like that, when you do brake load, the frogs go down. When you do MOR, the frogs go up. Don't know why, but that's the way the specifications are written. So we actually have a placard on our machine because every time we come to it, it's like, okay, are they supposed to be pointing up, pointing down? Um, and then you load it to the point where, again, you snap it in half. From a calculation standpoint, uh, modulus of rupture is looking at pounds per square inch. It's looking at the cross-sectional area of what you're loading. Brake load is, is looking at pounds per inch. So it's just looking at the depth of the product. Uh, there's also, within MOR, you also have to measure the offset of where that fracture occurs from the center line. The, uh, the, like I said, the math is a little more complicated, but for this purpose, we were just going to show the brake load. So you have a product that you snap in half. And this one also has a requirement to where you do not load it um, at rates that exceed 2,000 pounds force per, per minute. For the calculation on this, it's, it's very simple to where you're just taking the load and dividing it by the, uh, the width of the face that you're loading. Efflorescence. Um, for this test, you're actually taking 10 brick. You're only test, technically you're only testing five, but you need 10 brick in order to perform the test. When you go through, you divide it into two groups that look similar. So you can divide them up into pairs that these two brick look the same, these two brick look the same, these two, and so on and so forth until you have 10 brick. You uh, remove any dirt that might influence the test, anything that's on it. You don't want to change, go out there with a chisel and change anything, but basically take a brush and wipe it down. Uh, you set one group of those pairs aside and then the other one, you actually stand up in a pan and fill it up with what, approximately one inch of water in the bottom of it, and it stands in the lab for a week, for seven days. And this is showing you to where we even have our uh, precision depth gauge readily available to, to check. But you're basically standing, and you don't want the product touching each other. They need to be far enough apart so they're not going to influence each other. And then you're filling it up with uh, uh, DI water deionized water. If you use tap water, then you could be putting something at it that's coming from your pipes into this, and it will give you a false positive. Um, after seven days, you inspect the first set of brick and uh, dry both sets for 24 hours. And then you compare the two brick side by side and here's the thing. We usually have, if there are any, if there are any brick that pass, yay. Boo. If there are any brick that fail, as in, you'll see in the picture, an extreme case, if there's anybody that has efflorescence and there's no question it has efflorescence, we're done. If it's any of them that we look at and it's like, ooh, that's on the borderline, we will actually go grab somebody else from the lab instead of the person that was doing the test. They'll set the brick up and we'll have somebody come in because you actually inspect it from 10 feet. And if you can't see it from 10 feet, readily see it from 10 feet, it passes. And the issue is, is if the operator that's doing it, he's usually the first time he's looking at it is from here. So his, his uh, inspection is biased right from the beginning because he knows what he's looking for. So that's one way that we've put in our process to help keep from giving or reduce the number of false positives on that. And that's something that if you guys do it, it's your, 
your uh, sites, that might be something to to do consider. Also, do you go get the guy every time? Because if you didn't, and every time you come and got me, I know I, I'm looking for what no. you call. No. Well, but that's just it. Even if you know that you're looking for efflorescence, unless you can see it, as in you can from 10 feet away, I'm coming at 10 feet away, unless I can point out where it's occurring, it's a pass. And there are, there are a lot of times that you'll come in there and it's like, you can sit there and stare at it for a minute and go, okay, I don't see it. And when you get closer, it's like, okay, now I see what you're talking about. I couldn't see it from back there. So it's okay. And the other thing to keep in mind too is that you're not just inspecting the front face. You're actually looking at all faces to where you're looking at the ends, you're looking at the, the beds, you're looking at all faces and you should not be able to see efflorescence on it. And then you, uh, we denote not only that it's effluoresced, but w what part of it effluoresced, so that we have that on the reports that we would supply to you as well. That's that 50 feet candles? What does it say? 50 foot candles. That's the, they just want to make sure that you're not walking in there and you have the lights turned off and oh, I don't see any effluorescence. Oh. It's just making sure you have enough light available that you can actually see it. And that's <coughs> what you don't want to see. And we keep, again, we keep the originals to set next to the test ones because there are some times that we run into to where it is it's not difficult to see what we think is efflorescence but when you compare it back to the original product there are times that that's actually in the original product and we want to make sure that we don't uh, confuse a cosmetic factor of the way the brick looks with an actual efflorescing brick. So that's actually the capillary action that's pulling that from all the different parts of the brick to wherever that water line Correct. is. Correct. Correct. Um, we're doing testing right now, I don't know if John mentioned it to you, that we're actually doing a whole program for ASTM that I've got a research project for looking at the procedure for efflorescence because there is a higher than, I guess, friendly uh, level of false positives and what we're finding is the actual drying temperature is affecting um, I won't say affecting but is amplifying the efflorescing effect and what we believe is happening is that when you go through and you put the samples in the water it soaks up the water like it would do if it was out in the environment however you're then taking it and putting it in a dryer at 230 degrees, which most people's houses don't see 230 degrees on the outside of them. And what's happening is that capillary effect is basically you're pulling water out of the product so fast that it's carrying the salt with it rather than redepositing on the inside of the pore. So there's some salts that wouldn't leave that readily and there are the cases of where we will get a failure, yet the manufacturer has been selling these brick for years and they've been in service for years and have never had a problem. So we know that that's an issue and I'm working on a whole series of testing right now to, to go through and try to come up with either a replacement for the current ASTM test or an alternative. So if you were to fail this, because to, dry, to do the test at lower temperatures, which we've done a whole series at 120 degrees, drying temperature but it takes like three weeks to actually dry the product but those didn't effloresce and then we've had some that we dried at lower temperature one of two of them that actually did effloresce so that's saying it will still detect efflorescence but we're trying to find the temperature range that best uh, identifies those product that'll have issues in service or give the best statistical representation of the products that would have problems in service. So, at any rate. IRA, uh, initial rate of absorption. There is no specification for this under 216, but normally we perform this just because then the brick mason has something to go off of to know how thirsty the, the brick will be. And this is just describing when you actually set a brick in water, how fast is it gonna drink it up? So you take five full size brick, you dry the brick completely. You measure the length and width of the face that's going to actually, the, the bed face, that's what you're setting in the mortar, setting in the water. You
you uh, place two bars to stand the product off the bottom of the pan that you're going to put the water in. And you want to make sure at least uh, it will hold, uh, let's see, at least 300 square inches of water. Um, the, the pans that we use at the lab, which you'll see in the picture, are actually special pans that we had made just because according to the standard, you're putting it in here and you're, you're uh, keeping the water at a half an inch deep on the side of the product. And you're maintaining it there. So that means you have to sit there with a little squeegee bottle and basically put the brick in there and keep filling it up to maintain it at a half an inch. Well, we don't have time to do that. So what we did, and this, this also has you where you start off with a, a, a sacrificial brick to start off to get an idea of rate of absorption so you know how fast to put the water in there to maintain the, the height. Um, ours, these pans are actually stainless steel pans and they have tubing at each corner that pokes up exactly a half an inch above the bar. Or actually it's a little bit less because we took into account the meniscus of the water as well, the curvature of the water. But they have tubes at each corner and we set level on that so that we can start flowing water in there continuously and when it gets up to that level it just starts going out through the tubes. And we can just keep water going in all the time. You set the product in there, it goes up quick and drops right back down because that increase in water height, it just pushes it out past the tubes. So it makes things a lot easier. So you set the brick in there and um, you basically start your timer and uh, after one minute you take the brick out, you dab it off and you take a weight on it. And maintain the water level during the testing, remove the brick, wipe it off, we just keep a damp towel, just dab it off, and then take your weight. Boy. Must be completed within 10 seconds. And again, this is all to make sure that you're not affecting the results by allowing more water to, to drain off while you go have lunch, and then you come back and take the weight and find out, that, hey, our absorption level isn't that high. For calculating the IRA, the, the IRA value is actually based off of 30 square inches of surface. And when you go through and do the measurement, um, if the surface area does not differ by plus or minus three quarters square inch, which again, you have to do your measurements and understand your product. Um, Otherwise, you have to cor correct for that difference in size to where you, on the equation. But this is basically going through and just taking the weight times 30 divided by the length and the breadth measurements that you took initially. And that will give you the, the gain per 30 square inches. Now, how does it know you have 30 square inches? That's what you're... you're you're taking measurements beforehand to look at what your face is that you're going to set down in it. Uh -huh. And if you're outside of it, then you have to adjust your equation accordingly. Okay. But that's uh, when you do the, the LB on the bottom, that length breadth, and having the 30 over, that's what's actually normalizing it per 30 square inch. Is that? Everything okay? Okay. Um, void area. And this again, this determines whether you fall under 216 or 652. Uh, you're basically taking your cord brick and taking a graded sand that is, I forget what the requirements are on it, but it's basically a severe, spherical sand. So it's not going to come out in clumps. It needs to be dry so that it flows. And you're pouring it into the void on the brick and you have your brick set on a piece of paper. And when you get through, okay, select your 10 brick. Um, I think this leaves off, no, it does have it on there. So you're also taking the dimensions from it too. The, so this is giving you the outside volume of the brick. Then you place the brick on, on uh, paper 
and fill the cores with sand. And once you get it filled with sand, you basically take a steel edge and trowel across the top of it and scrape off the excess sand that's sitting on top of the brick. Then you lift the brick up. You transfer the, the sand into a graduated cylinder, which is a thousand milliliter cylinder that just has all the volume measurements along the top of it. And you read the measurement off the cylinder. So when you took this and poured it in, you can see through the, the cylinder what the sand level is. You take that reading and then you can calculate out the void area. The percent void area is equal to the volume of sand in milliliters uh, divided by the volume of the brick. The reason this 16.4 is here is because uh, when you take the sand measurement in millimeter or milliliters, one milliliter is equal to one cc. That's just a standard. So by doing that, by taking the milliliter measurement, putting it in here, and then taking your volume here and multiply it times 16.4, you're converting the inches to cubic centimeters. So if you take, um, there's 2.54 centimeters per inch. So if you take 2.54 times 2.54 times 2.54, that gives you 16.4. Uh, micro, isn't it? Pardon? Are you have a micro? This? Yeah. That's just that's just the well, you know, sub. It's just the uh -oh. unit. De that's not for micro, though. Uh, you know, micro like a little unit. He's he'd have the he'd have the little whoops he'd have the little uh, little it's leg nice. he'd have the little leg coming down though his micro. Yeah, the little yeah. Yeah. Freeze thaw. For doing freeze thaw testing on the product, you're selecting five half brick, um, and then you're weighing each brick. You're carefully examining the bricks because you want to see what's there to begin with before you start the test. If it already has cracks or anything in it, you want to mark those because you don't want to be looking at it afterwards and saying, okay, did this crack because of freeze thaw? or was it already there? Then you submerge the brick in a thaw tank and, and then, uh, this is leaving a little bit out, but we usually soak it for four hours. So you submerge it into a thaw tank and let the brick soak and become saturated for four hours. You pull them out, you drain off the water off the pan, and then you leave, it has that in there, you leave a half an inch of water in the bottom of the pan that the brick are standing in and you put it in the freezer for 20 hours. And then after 20 hours, you take the, the pans back out of the freezer and drop them back in the dunk tank. And then they will thaw in there for four hours. And after four hours, you take them out, drain the water off, leave your water in the bottom of the pan, put it back in the freezer. And it does that over and over again to where you do that for 50 cycles. You get four uh, four cycles in a week because we don't work during the, we're, we're lazy. We don't work on the weekends in our lab. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're slackers. Uh, so after the, on Friday, they will take the pan out of the freezer, drop it in the dunk tank, let it soak for four hours, and then they will take it and pour all the water off and it sits out in the, the lab over the weekend. Monday, come in, put it back in the dunk tank for four hours, take it out, drain it out down to half an inch, put it back in the freezer and it starts to cycle again. So then you get four more cycles in. And you do that for 50 cycles. So it takes, it takes about 13, 14 weeks to actually perform this test. Uh, you inspect, uh, let's see, blah, 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 continue freeze thaw, one cycle per day. Um, we do look at them as the test is going on too. So at the beginning of the week before we put them back in the tank, we will see if there are any major fissures in it. Um, we will see if it's lost, just eyeballing it, if it's lost too much weight uh, that we know that it's not going to pass, then we'll discontinue the test at that point and just go ahead and fail them. Uh, and afterwards, you just keep going until you get the 50 cycles in. And this is talking about if it's lost 3% weight or more, you know it's not going to pass. So. 
and then at the end of the test you dry and weigh each brick. So this is what our dunk tank looks like. It's basically a big uh, feed trough. Mm -hmm. And we, per ASTM, uh, the water has to stay at a particular temperature. It has to stay circulating, so there's, uh, you can't see it from this angle, but there's actually a heater, a uh, rod heater right here, and a, a pump that actually circulates the water. And that's what it looks like when it's standing in the freezer, so we basically have it standing in pans of water. If they're thin product, we'll use a separate grating to keep them vertical. So if we're doing thin brick, we have special uh, containers that have slots cut in them that will keep the brick standing up. For calculations, uh, you calculate the weight loss as a percentage, uh, re-examine the surface of the brick, and record the presence of any new cracks. Um, the brick is considered to fail the test if the weight loss is greater than 0.5% of its initial weight. The brick is broken into two or more pieces, obviously. The brick develops a crack longer than the shortest dimension of the brick. So if it's a standard modular, if it has a crack greater than two and a quarter, it's a no-go. Um, and then you, law, you basically record whether it passed or failed, and all of them have to pass for C216. Measurement of size. You take 10 brick, and this is where we're also in discussions, too, of how to do dimensional measurements. Uh, the way the standard's Excellent. written is it's still assuming you're using a tape measure, but even that, a tape measure has to be one of the fancy ones that you get from, you can get them from Lowe's and Depot, they usually carry at least one, but it has to measure in 30 seconds of an inch, not sixteenths of an inch. And you go through and you take measurements to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. Uh, it's easier to do with calipers. You measure the length, anybody have a brick? Nobody has a brick? Oh, I need a free brick though. You got one? Got one on you? Okay. We'll 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 cut once he comes back with the brick because <laughs> when you take measurements off of off the brick, you're actually taking four measurements per dimension, and there's a specific way you have to take it. I didn't think about bringing a brick on the plane with me. Uh, you measure the width in the same man manner, the depth in the same manner. Here we go. Ooh, nice and warm. Um, when you're going through and measuring the length of the brick, you're measuring from the center of the face to the center of the face, about an eighth of an inch in. You also measure it here, you measure it here, and you measure it here. When you go through, and this is where I usually get screwed up, uh, if you're measuring the depth, you measure it here, you measure it here, you measure it here, you measure it here. Measuring the height, you measure it here, you measure it here, here, and there. And it takes a little while to get used to it that you're, uh, if you're recording it, we, we cheat in that we have all of our stuff digital and the calipers are plugged into the computer and when we take measurements, you just go through and you step on a pedal and it logs it in. But you'll figure out really quickly that you're taking the wrong measurement. This one will be more difficult because of the, the dimensions are so close to each other. But like on a standard mod, if you go through and take the wrong measurement, you'll know right away because you'll have three and five eighths and two and a quarter right next to each other. But that's per ASTM, that's how you actually measure the product. Um, now where it gets interesting, you measure the brick to the nearest 32nd. Then you average it to the nearest 64th. Then you report it to the nearest 32nd. Just to keep everybody clear on all that. Yeah. We also measure out of square where you take the product and you put a level along a, 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 a square along the outside of, sorry, not level, but you put a square and then we have a, which I didn't bring any of those with us, the way we do it, you can do it with calipers, but you're basically looking for any gap in between the, 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 the square and the product. When you have this face up against it, is there any gap here? 
and you flip it over and look at the other side and then you measure that to the nearest 30 second as well. We have a wedge that if any of you guys get to it, um, we'll probably manufacture or have our machine shop make some more, I think they're 50, 55 dollars a piece, but it's a stainless steel wedge that's calibrated that we can take and put there and slide it in and whatever tick mark it makes it to, that's the, the reading off of it. The tick marks are actually 30 seconds of an inch apart. And well, it just makes it easy. Like, some like conditions or, or hits or whatever, how do you do that? Like have the, oh, the ends are bent down or hit down or whatever. Yeah, a lot of the brake makers texture on the edges, so uh, it might be like a shaver or some sort. So is there any like anything? I gotta find the brake when I go through the hit, hits like this. Oh, you're talking about um, surface features. Yeah. Uh, you're you're going through. You have to have an understanding when you're looking at the product. You can't. I mean, if it if it is a surface feature, you don't include it. So you would have to move further in on the product and take the measurement there. So if you have the edges rounded over or um, uh, indented, then you would move in further on the body and take the measurement. You, st you have to interpret what you're looking at. That uh, um, There's also, okay, this is basically going through everything that we just talked about. There's also warpage in that when you do concave, convex, you're putting a straight edge across here. And again, you can use uh, feeler gauges. We use that, that uh, uh, measuring wedge as well. And you're basically looking for concave and convex this way, depending on what the specification is, whether you're trying to. This gets into more when you get under 216. You have grades and you have classes. Uh, grade is whether you're. Um, uh, severe weather, mod SW or MW, severe weather, moderate weather, which has to do with more freeze thaw performance, durability performance, and then you get into classes where you can do uh, um, FX, FS, and that's more tolerance on the measurements. So to meet 216, you don't have to be uh, real tight on tolerances. You still need to meet FS requirements, but uh, FX is where it gets really tight and that's where you'd have to measure very closely. There's also um, FA as well, which is architecture, which means whatever the architect says it is, that's what it needs to be. So this again goes through and you're measuring to the nearest 30 second. Con concave is the opposite of convex. And it's basically doing the same thing, but you're looking for gaps at the ends because it's bowed this way. So the bottom would be bowed. Um, concave, convex. Uh, I don't know of anybody, matter of fact, we haven't done this at the lab since I've been there and I'm going to be pulling this out of the presentation, but we do, we can do length measurements which are involved with drilling dimples in, cementing in pins, and it's, it, again, we haven't really done that in so long, it's, I'll just skip this. Frogs, anybody have frogs? Yeah. Okay. Um, for going through and measuring this, it's somewhat similar to voids. You're trying to capture the volume that are, that's inside the frogs. Uh, I, I encourage you just to read through it. It's basically, you're using straight edges and projecting measurements to get the dimensions of inside the frog. You're using your best guess and subtracting that out of the total volume of the brick that you're measuring. So this just has some... So calculating, it's again, it's looking at the sum of all the areas of the, and the depths of the frogs. I got a question that just reminded me when I went and did y'all's class, uh, they couldn't give us an answer on the <coughs> the void that it says it's got to be half inch. The brick's got to be half inch. I think it was from the edge of the void to the outside of the brick. Correct. But he said, as a uh, Jim, the old guy. Yeah, Jim Frederick. Uh huh. He said that. Uh, there was some question as to whether that was to the outside of the brick or the outside of the frog. It's Did not clearly. That? It's not clearly stated. He said they were working on something, and this was years yeah. ago. 
it's still not clearly stated. It's not. It must not be a hot topic because it hasn't changed. I was just curious. I guess no. that just reminded me of talking about the twelve. Yep. Okay, poor size and firing. Um, dry brick tend to have very large pore size volumes in them. And then when you're firing it, the bricks shrink, you're densifying it. Um, some of the, the actual physics that goes on gets interesting to think about. Um, when you go through during firing, we tend to seal the smaller pores so that the volume of the pores decreases and the average size of the pores shifts towards larger. Which seems kind of weird, but if you, the, the, if you think about it, when, you, when you're firing a brick, you're shrinking it. You're, you're getting the pour, the, the pour water out, you're forming glass, you're shrinking it. If you have a pore inside of it, a sphere inside of it, the sphere isn't shrinking. The material around it is shrinking. So it'll actually grow because all of the webs of material in between the pores is shrinking as well and it's pulling out. It's moving away from the hole. So when you go through and actually fire these, this, this is showing a graphic representation of a uh, this was a test that we'd done a while back to where we'd taken a part that was fired at the plant, which is the black line here that kind of goes up. And this is your pore diameter and then the volume of that pore diameter. So if you've got a peak, then that's saying most of the uh, volume of the pores is at that, that diameter. And when you fire it to where this the blue was fired at 1787, the green was fired at 1877, and then the red was fired at 1967. You can see the blue, the green, the red, it's all shifting towards the larger pore size, but the peaks are all dropping. So the actual volume of pores, the smaller ones are sealing up, but the larger ones are actually growing a little bit more. And this is graphically showing you from measurements with the equipment what's going on. Um, there's also a Miyagi, Magi, Maji test that can be done that, that tries to give a representation or a feeling for how a brick will perform, how uh, um, uh, how it will perform to freeze thaw and how uh, rugged the product is. Um, and it goes off of actual pore structure. The, the, the philosophy being is mainly focused around three micron pore sizes. And as that quantity goes up, when you have small pores, you tend to have capillary action. When you do cold water absorption on the product, you're measuring the, the small pores. You're measuring the capillary action. When you drop the brick in there, those are the pores that suck up the water and hold on to it. Larger pores, when you pull the brick out, the water just basically flows right back out of it. When you do boiled water, you're actually capturing more of the closed pores as well as the larger pores. And that's the reason for doing the drying process that you do, or the, excuse me, not the drying, but the cooling process that you do on the boiled water, is that helps the brick retain water in the larger pores because it's actually still cooling when you pull it out and put it on the, the, the scale to measure it and it tends to hold that water. So this, this actual calculation goes through and it's focused on 3 micron and per testing that was done from this group they found that with this calculation when you go through and measure the pore sizes and the pore volumes Anything over 70 tends to indicate that the brick will be, or, yeah, will, will be durable. Anything less than 55, the brick will not be durable. And then the 55 to 70 tends to be a, a bit of a gray area. If you measure in there, then flip a quarter. And 
what we find is from the ASTM side, you are looking at C over B ratio, the cold water absorption, and compression, uh, the compressive strength to determine durability. Uh, saturation coefficient uh, looks at the 24 hour and 5 hour boiled absorptions. Uh, when you measure the cold water absorption of the brick, the saturation takes place by capillary action. When we measure the boiled for the brick, the saturation remains in the, uh, excuse me, remaining in the pores. We create suction in the unsaturated pores of the brick as it cools. Uh, brick typically becomes saturated through capillary suction when exposed to water in the environment. So when you put it in the wall, that's basically what you're looking at is just the rainwater hitting it and it drinks it in. The degree of capillary suction is a function of the size of the pores of the brick. Very small pores have a high degree of capillary action. Um, when the ratio of cold water absorption for the boiled brick, is, um, excuse me, cold water absorption to the boiled water absorption is high, the, that results in a high saturation coefficient, we know that the majority of the pores are small. And again, as the the cold water is divided by the boiled, so as your cold water absorption goes up, your C over B is going to go up. And this just shows some instances of cold water over boiled water as we're related to absorption. General trend of decreasing C over B ratio with decreasing absorption. And you can follow the trends of the, the curves are typically in a downward as you go along the C uh, CB ratio with the saturation. A very low absorption at the where the the reason there are alternatives when you look at C216 under ASTM there's a requirement of for severe weather of a compression ratio of a minimum of 2500 PSI um, C over B ratio of 0.78 and uh, there's nothing listed or excuse me there's a boiled water as well but there's also an alternative that if your C over B ratio is too high you can look at the uh, cold the uh, cold water absorption and if it's below 8% it still passes the reason being is especially on brick that have low absorptions a lot of times the boiled waters won't uh, be very high at all, which will inflate what the cold water looks like because you're dividing it by that boiled water. So we readily get cold, uh, get cold water absorptions that are 2.2, 1.3%, but the boiled water is even lower and it'll make the, the C over B be like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, which would technically fail. However, that's the reason they put the alternatives in. And again, this is just showing, looking at uh, a few different brick. There's generally a trend which is specific to each type of brick where CAB ratio decreases as the ratio of fine pores decreases. And again, it's just how everything's calculated. As stated earlier, it is the small pores that are the primarily saturated during the cold water absorption and as the quantity of these pores decreases the C and the C over B decreases which makes the ratio go up. There is also a, a series of tests that were performed at the lab that were looking at um, this is basically looking at soak temperatures just to show how you can impact the ratings on your brick. Um, if your, your absorptions are too high, one, one alternative to look at is to actually fire or keep them in the hot zone a little bit longer so things can condense, your pores can shrink and seal up, or excuse me, pores will grow but your small guys will shrink. And this just shows um, on these two examples here, this one had a four hour soak, this one had a six hour soak. So the dark blues are the the uh, sixes, 
And basically, this, they got that backwards. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh-huh. I didn't put it together. Um, but at any rate, this is showing that... Oh, no, no, it's dropping the C over B. That's the C over B. Yeah, the boil drops and that you're basically uh, impacting the C over B ratio. And these were pore size measurements on the same, same uh, on one of the test groups. And it's looking at the four hour compared to the six hour. The middle pore size for the four hour was at 1.021 and it dropped to 0.661, or excuse me, 551. The porosity going to the longer soak actually dropped the porosity. And then the pores greater than 3% went up dramatically, which is what we were talking about. The reason you want the durability for freeze thaw is so that you do not have buildings that look like that, where you're spalling brick off the front of the building because customers tend to frown at that. Um, when looking at the freeze thaw durability, the ability to saturate the brick, withstand repetitive freezing, uh, residual expansion, permanent length change, because it's actually causing fissures in the material and breaking the material apart. Um, and it's actually, I think that's in here. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to go through the testing and look at it. It's not so much that you are freezing the brick, which does put strain on it, but it's the repetitive freezing. And what happens is you put the product in, or the product's in service, water wicks in, and it freezes. Sun comes up, starts hitting it, starts melting the outside, but the, outs the inside could be still frozen. And if it doesn't thaw out completely, you now have a layer of water and you start free freezing again and water expands when you freeze it. So now you have a sheet of ice in the brick here and a sheet of ice in the brick here and you've got water in the middle that's trying to freeze and it has nowhere to go. If it's just the freezing at the front, you'll keep pushing the water ahead as it's freezing and it puts less strain on it, but it's the repetitive freezing that really puts a big load. And that's the reason why the front of the brick will heave off if you don't have the right porosity and the right strength in the brick. Um, for failures, there are things that, uh, uh, factors that can really amplify things. Uh, insufficient drainage, because again, if the water doesn't get there in the first place, you can freeze the brick all you want and it doesn't care. Uh, whoops, back. Omnidirection exposure, such as chimneys, so that you have two sides of the brick or the outside corners of walls. Those are more susceptible because it's getting more influence from temperature from multiple directions. Superimposed stress. I have a lab report I just issued this past week for a company that's looking at an older building and from looking at the photos and looking at the analysis, it's not just the environment it's being exposed to, it's the way they built the building. There's so much load on these brick and surprise, surprise, the brick over the windows aren't really suffering that bad because they have the lintels there and they don't have as much load on top of it as opposed to the brick down at the bottom of the, the walls. And then uh, poor masonry pra practices that if it's not installed correctly, then you can definitely cause a lot of other issues. And it not only goes for freeze thaw, it goes for efflorescence to where we get invited to quite a few investigations and very seldom is it the brick. It's usually how it was installed, what kind of uh, mortar was used, or what if water gets behind the wall, that's usually where you run into issues. Properties related to durability, compressive strength. Um, again, you think about it, you get your water freezing in there, but if the brick is super strong, then the water can't create enough force to actually cause an issue. Or you keep the water from getting into it in the first place, and then there's nothing there to put the stress on the product to begin with. Uh, good C over B ratio. And these are showing 
basically uh, compressive strength isn't a super high correlation to the durability mainly because most of the brick are within a certain range and water if you get in there and have that damming force it, it creates a lot of force and uh, it would get almost unrealistic to fire the product that hard to, to overcome it. The, C, the cold water absorption is a fairly decent thing to look at. C over B ratio is a really good thing to look at. Um, capillary action of the brick, how much water it's going to drink is a very good thing to look at to understand it. Um, pore size distribution again works hand in hand with capillarity on how it's going to drink water. Modulus of, of rupture is, is fair and that's dealing again more with pavers to where how well it's going to hold up. IRA doesn't really tell you a whole lot. It's telling you the initial rate but it's not telling you how much ultimately it'll pick up. Durability issues. Uh, current standards, C216, pass some non-durable bricks and this is basically performance again. Uh, when you're doing the testing per ASTM standard and I've, if any of you guys end up communicating with me and asking me questions whether this product will do well or not, this is all looking at statistics. Statistically in the past, product that were tested that met these requirements performed well statistically. Doesn't mean all of them are going to do well. So um, under 216 there are some pass that non-durable brick, uh, fail some durable brick to where it goes both ways. Only approximately 80% accurate. But for what we have right now in tool wise, it's, it, it does a reasonable job. Uh, freezing and thawing test, omnidirectional versus unidirectional, we, we don't really do that much testing with to where we're doing, well, I take that back, we're doing basically the omnidirectional because we're standing the product in the, the freeze pans. Uh, durability predictions by lab tests, the C67 is the 50, 50 cycle partial sat saturation omnidirectional. There's also a, a sulfate crystallization which is omnidirectional. These are other types of tests that are out there. Acme face freeze thaw which is a, a modified test for testing freeze thaw. There's also a British cabinet test and a Dutch cabinet test that are performed in Europe. For the British test, um, it's taking brick and building a wall out of it, a small wall, and the Dutch test is very similar except they use rubber pads instead of mortar in between and do a, a sandwich pattern. And both tests, uh, the walls is saturated then exposed to repeated freezing and thawing cycles, typical failure from these tests simulates the type of failure seen in the field unlike the C67. And so they basically have a box freezer with openings at the side that they, after they, they uh, saturate the panels, they clamp it up next to it and cycle it and then pull it out and thaw it again. Takeaways. Um, as Dr. Robinson used to say, durability is a function of pore structure and the nature of the fired bond, which again comes back to absorption and compression to where just to see how your product developed during firing. ASTM testing is designed to give a statistical likelihood of the brick failing after it is in service. There's even a note in 216 that's rather important that people overlook. Although grade is associated with resistance to deterioration under freeze thaw exposure, freeze thaw resistance of the clay brick unit is also affected by the properties of the surrounding materials, the construction materials, and the overall environment which the clay is, unit is placed. So if your brick is absolutely beautiful and up to spec, if the, the person using it doesn't install it correctly, they can put it in stress that can help lead to an early demise. Uh, must consider all factors that affect C over B and pore structure, grinding, screening, particle size distribution, additives, temperatures, soak times, schedules, everything. If you have any issues or believe you have issues when you're going through and measuring your absorptions.
or even the performance of the brick in general. Consider the effect of process defects, uh, laminations, uh, extrusion cracks, drying cracks, firing cracks, etc., on durability and how to best eliminate these defects, improve your process and materials. So if you can see them in the product coming out, chances are it's not going to bode well when you go to test them or it's not helping you at least. And think outside the box about durability testing many companies already do. Um, these ASTM has the specifications and methods for testing but that doesn't mean that you can't come up with something that's more descriptive or better. Um, by all means try and if you believe you have something better go through and compare to what you get under ASTM and in the real world and if again it looks like it's better descriptive call me. I want to know about it because then we can look at changing the standard if it is something that tests out to show that it better describes how the product will do in a real world environment. That's the, that's the ultimate goal of ASTM is to be able to come up with a standard set of tests that the general populace can do or I shouldn't say that but labs across the country companies across the country can do that will describe the performance of the brick accurately or the product accurately that will also ultimately lead to the whoever consumes them getting what they're, they're, you're saying that you're making. And that's the whole idea. And that's it. Any questions? Overwhelming, isn't it? What's that? It's a bit overwhelming, isn't it? It was at first. I mean, it was a lot. It was. I, I'll tell you. I'll be the first one. Although I'll. I'll also say concrete is worse. Uh, the ASTMs are all, oh so much fun to read. Oh my God, that's one of the things that's actually a big initiative that's going on to where John and I are part of the committees, and periodically through the year we get ballots that are all the changes in our ASTM groups that are are being proposed that we have to review and vote on whether we uh, support it or don't support it or if there's anything we see that might also need to be addressed. Um, it takes a very long time typically to make a change in ASTM because it has to be reviewed by so many people on so many levels and if at any level there's an issue typically it gets knocked all the way back down and starts over again and starts coming up trying to address that issue. Um, at the same time, we have initiatives going on that shouldn't run into any, any bumps or anything like that that are just looking at uh, consistency of terminology, consistency of units, and things like that throughout the ASTM so that when you jump from uh, 216 to 67 to 902 for pavers, 1272 for pavers, uh, 62 for chimneys, all these different ASTMs, when you start reading through it, you've got the same verbiage going on, hopefully a lot of the same processes. Uh, brick is much, again I'm a brick guy, brick is much more uniform and friendly when it comes to testing than concrete. Concrete, when you start reading theirs, it's like, oh my god. The equivalent of their, they don't have a 67 because there are so many difference, differences when you're testing mortar, testing uh, CMUs, concrete masonry units, all of their stuff has their own group of, of standards and they're, they're usually about three or four times longer than what ours are. And the thing that I just, I get a chuckle out of is they have the, um, the methods for doing or the specifications and methods for doing something in the same standard but it doesn't really give that much. I'm trying to remember which number it is, but it has like the first seven pages, I believe, are the methods for doing it. And then all the specifications are in the appendices and it's about 25 pages long. And trying to find out which one actually applies to what you're testing is, it's remarkable. But those are, there, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good information out there and there's a lot of people working on it, but it's just, a, it's, 
you really don't want it moving fast because then you miss something. And that's the reason why it's built the way it is and there's so many people reviewing it. I just ixnade one for the requirements for labs because it was very much weighted towards the concrete. Every one of the testing criteria for certification were all concrete. And we do some concrete testing at our lab, but we do very little of it. So now I'd be asking my group to go through and become proficient in, I think it was eight different concrete ASTM standards when we don't even perform them. So, and of course it was concrete guys that actually were proposing the change. So it's the, that's again the whole reason for getting a lot of people involved. What about mortar? You said earlier that about 90% of all incandescence is really mortar. Mm -hmm. Why is their standard so lax? There is no efflorescence specification in mortar because there is no way that would ever pass. I mean, it's, it's a calcium illuminate cement to where it's, it's got your calcium in it. Yeah. But it's, again, a lot of that, the efflorescence is coming from the mortar, but it's typically because the wall wasn't constructed correctly. There, is, there wasn't enough uh, uh, water, um, I guess, moisture prevention within the wall to keep water from getting behind the wall and carrying the calcium to the front and causing the issue. But yeah, typically most of it is coming from construction practices and not a whole lot from brick. Doesn't mean that you don't have to pay attention to it in brick. You don't want your brick going out that can produce the problem because the customer will let you know. And the it looks like bad brick. Even yeah. new brand new housing. And, and why, why do they always blame the brick? Because it's on the brick. <laughs> because that's where you see it. You're not going to see it in the, the mortar. So it's something that the, the industry understands that the customers don't. The customers just see what their wall looks like and throw up a flag. Typically the architects don't understand it for the most part. And again, the contractor, the, everybody's looking for who to point the finger at when it, point, when it pops up and that's when the flags start flying and we need to figure out where it's coming from. But yeah, it's, it, it's not typically from the brick. It's just you see it on the brick. Any questions? Not one? So you guys will be able to answer all the, the questions on the final exam tomorrow. Oh yeah, 100%. All right. All right. all right, just making sure. Looking forward to the math and the... No books, no calculators. No cell phones. <laughs>